since as long as I can remember, I've had a deep connection with the ocean. I grew up in and out of the water, seeing the ocean as one of the most mysterious, captivating, and powerful forces in the world. I quickly got involved with ocean advocacy at a young age, starting an ocean-focused environmental club at my school and working with a flurry of ocean-related environmental groups. Much of the time, when we talk about climate change, we exclusively talk about how it's affecting the land, from deforestation to desertification. However, the ocean covers 71% of the Earth's surface. We are far more reliant on it and our water than we like to think. The world's water systems also connect us, which brought me to work on ocean conservation and water issues globally. Specifically, I've had the opportunity to lead Think Ocean, a youth global network spanning 15 countries that works on raising awareness of and action on the intersection of climate change and our ocean. Over the years, my experiences have taught me of the magnitude of, the, of our environmental challenges. It's shown me the issues of plastic pollution in Cameroon, the recession of the glaciers in the Alps in Italy, the rise of sea levels in Egypt, the costs of air and water pollution in India, and much more. However, most of all, I found that I had to unlearn many of the ways I used to think about climate change. When first learning about environmentalism, many of us are told that we have to make individual choices to protect our planet. Recycling, taking shorter showers, eating sustainably. However, I've come to learn that climate change and its many facets are not individualistic. They are systematic. Therefore, we must critically review our system and social tendencies that got us to where we are today. For example, when most people hear climate change, they generally think of an increase in temperatures and destruction of the environment. However, we need to reframe our perceptions of this crisis to instead focus on its human implications. It could bring widespread economic fallout, unprecedented mass relocations of people, and threaten global stability. Today, let's discuss how our water will be affected and delve into what makes this issue so hard to solve. In my time as a youth ocean advocate, I've, had, I've been able to work on water-related issues in Egypt and South Asia, and their local crises demonstrate the urgency of today's challenges. Therefore, Let's first turn to the rising seas in Egypt. Specifically, let's zoom into Alexandria to examine how this issue poses a threat to local coastal communities. Pictured here in the above slide, we can see that much of the Nile River Delta, where Alexandria is located, is at or below sea level, which corresponds to the colors blue and light green. Alexandria is the second largest city in Egypt with highly populated areas surrounding it. It is both geographically and socioeconomically vulnerable to the to rising sea levels. A research paper published in 2015 found that an increase in just a half meter in sea levels could inundate most of its beaches and without effective adaptation could displace about 2 million people. Another half meter could displace more than 6 million people. Well, the sea is rising. And it's projected that by 2050, there will be a rise in more than a half meter of water on Egyptian coasts. And it's expected to eventually rise to a full meter. It's also projected that Egypt's national agricultural sector could be cut in half by 2060 due to groundwater being contaminated with salt, resulting in a potential destabilization in regional grain supply and the economy. These challenges, regardless of if we recycle eat sustainably, turn off the lights when we live the room, are still happening. Instead, we need large scale structural changes to prepare communities for what's to come and mitigate future costs. However, sea level is not exclusive to Alexandria and it's not exclusive to Egypt. It's a global threat. Let's zoom out to see the implications of this issue across the globe. Pictured here is a map showing the 2060 projected populations of people living in areas most at risk to sea level rise, which are called Low Elevation Coastal Zones, or LECZ for short. Currently, this is where 10% of the global population lives. Sea level rise, 
and its corresponding effects are highly complex, contingent on environmental, political, and socioeconomic factors. However, estimates range from anywhere from 88 million to 1.4 billion people who will eventually be displaced due to sea level rise. Therefore, inundation could lead to hundreds of millions of people forced to move domestically or even seek asylum internationally. Besides the obvious threats that this will have towards the communities affected, it could also threaten our global system. However, there are many other ways that climate change can affect our future. Let's now turn to the issue of water scarcity, which is a very real and present issue that could be exacerbated due to the effects of climate change. Let's zoom in to South Asia, which is home to one of the worst water crises in the world. Pictured here, the deeper the shade of red, the more severe water stress is being experienced in that part of the map. Currently, only 20% of Pakistan's population have access to safe drinking water, with the remaining 80% included by sewage, fertilizer, pesticides, or industrial effluents. And this pollution is the culprit for 30% of deaths nationally across Pakistan. Likewise, India is facing severe water shortages. A 2019 report by researchers out of MIT found that 600 million people, for context, that is nearly twice the size of the United States, face high to extreme water scarcity. Another report by Nidhi Ayad project that the crisis will only get worse, with national water demand expected to be double that of available supply by 2030. As the climate continues to change, and it continues to warm, it threatens to eliminate key sources of water. The Indus River Basin, a vital river system that both India and Pakistan rely on, also relies on glaciers. However, these glaciers are disappearing causing salt water to creep its way into the rivers and the amount of water available to decrease. Further, weather patterns have become far less predictable and droughts more prolonged, threatening to make their water crisis only worse. Yet, as with sea level rise, water scarcity is not exclusive to South Asia. It's a global threat. Let's now zoom out to see how this is affecting the rest of the world. The above map shows the degree of water stress expected for each country by 2040, with a darker shade of red corresponding with more water stress. Currently, 2.4 billion people are living within watersheds that are experiencing water scarcity. And similar to Pakistan and India, the effects of climate change threaten to exacerbate this shortage, threatening both access to safe drinking water, as well as the stability of various industries reliant on water supply. Unfortunately, the effects of water scarcity, sea level rise, or other issues related to climate change will not be distributed equally. Poorer communities and people of color are poised to be the most affected. Climate gentrification is happening right now, with folks being pushed into less hospitable areas and areas more likely to be hit the hardest by the effects of climate change. Let's now turn to New Orleans and see how the damages from Hurricane Katrina demonstrate the environmental racism present around the world. Here are two maps, one showing the wealth disparities, the percent of poverty in each area of the city, which is signified by shades of blue, and one showing the percent of each part of the city that was predominantly black, also signified by the color blue. New Orleans has a history of segregation, and this systematic oppression, which contributes towards keeping communities of color in poverty, also put them at a higher risk of the effects of climate change. Here, we see the deaths per ward of the city. It is startlingly aligned with the demographic makeup of the city, showing that poor communities and communities of color were the hardest hit by the disaster. Unfortunately, this is a trend that can be seen elsewhere from black and brown New Yorkers being hit hardest by Hurricane Sandy to minority communities and poorer communities being again and again most harshly affected by natural disasters. Those same communities then take longer to recover due to higher costs and generally having less savings, magnifying pre-existing wealth disparities. 
Now, a major question presents itself. If these are the risks, and we know the risks, why aren't we acting now? Why aren't we making the necessary changes to prepare for our future? Well, to preface this, I just want to acknowledge that people, both young and old, are working day in and day out to build a better future. The biggest obstacle to solving slow-moving crises like climate change and others is the human tendency of temporal discounting. We discount the future and prioritize the present. Similarly, we discount costs, seeing them as less impactful or pressing the further on the horizon they sit. As a student, I'm a lot less stressed about a 30-page paper assigned a month before it's due than a day before it's due. This systematic procrastination can give us a dangerous sense of complacency. However, without acting right now, further costs will accumulate and could build to an insurmountable amount. Therefore, we need to reframe the ways we think about our decisions. And a great way to reframe our thinking is through intergenerational action and elevating the role of young people in our decision making. Young people, Gen Z folks like myself, we will be forced to reckon with the future being created today. Whereas past environmentalists advocated for future generations, those generations are here, now, in the form of today's youth. This is why the actions of youth organizations like Fridays for Future, Zero Hour, the Think Ocean Society, Extinction Rebellion, and many others are so integral for acting on today's crises. Youth climate coalitions have mobilized millions of people to organize in support of climate action, protesting for change. Climate change is an existential threat to our world, my generation, and future generations. And these demonstrations have helped to reframe the dialogue on climate change. For example, I was able to attend the 2019 UN Climate Summit. Many of the world's leaders, heads of states, and even leaders of municipalities were present. Their words were comforting, but the summit was only really notable due to youth, such as Greta Thunberg, who reprimanded elected representatives for inaction. This reprimanding, which youth activists, by the way, have been doing for years at such events, has put pressure on our leaders, compelling them to take this crisis more seriously. However, every successful environmental movement has been intergenerational, whether with advisors, funders, co-organizers, or, or participators, even the most youth-led movements benefit from working with people of all ages. This focus isn't just a matter of narrative either, but it's a matter of action, of making space for future leaders. It is vital that members of Generation Z are given seats at the decision-making table and given more opportunities to get involved. Now, this does not mean deferring all responsibility and decisions to youth. This means building an intergenerational coalition to address problems together. Today, we only brushed the surface of climate change, examining only a few facets of this far-reaching threat. We spoke about the upwards of a billion people affected by sea level rise, the 2.4 billion people currently affected by water scarcity, and how climate change disproportionately affects communities of color and poorer communities. However, it's important to remember that much of what we've talked about is not set in stone. We do not know the full extent of what climate change will bring. However, we do know that there will be costs. And we know that the decisions we make now will define the magnitude of tomorrow's challenges. Regardless of what we've discussed today, I consider myself an optimist. I see incredible hope in building a better future, a more just future, and truly tackling these issues together. However, we can't use the same archaic methods that got us into this mess. Moving forward, we need to make space for and empower young voices, and the voices of those that are most adversely affected by this crisis. We need to face the great challenges ahead of us instead of shying away. We are living through the most formidable emergency this world has ever seen. Let's start acting like it. Thank you.